Welcome, everyone. Again, I'm Lama Suridas. Welcome to my Awakening Now podcast series on the Be Here Now Network, founded by Ram Das. Today, I'm talking to my dear Dharma brother, Father Michael Halloran in New York, Sensei, a Zen master in an established lineage, Robert Kennedy's lineage, etc., as well as a Catholic priest and scholar of good standing with the church. He was a monk for a long time in the great silent Benedictine monastery in France, La Grande Chartreuse, the great charter house. I actually happened to visit there once with the Dalai Lama. Usually nobody can go in when I lived in southern France in the 80s, and His Holiness was invited in by the abbot, and we waited outside for several hours, and His Holiness was invited in and escorted around into that very, very, very silent precinct and cloister. But we were outside in a very remote valley. It was really uh, quiet, the silence. It's like the silence of the deepest heart cave, heart space. The inner space, the sacred inner space that's bigger than the outside. So welcome, Father Michael, and I'm just going to call you Michael from now on, but with all respects, I know you're a Zen master, you're also a great guy, and we, a dear friend, so yeah, well, how are you today? Don't, I'm excellent, I certainly don't, we certainly don't stand on titles when we get to know one another, I try to find our true name somewhere, and, uh, so Surya, I'll just call you Surya, you know, as I go along, you know. Yeah. Surya is fine, or Sir for short. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> we can call me Dom. Uh, my name was Dom Bruno in the monastery. Okay, Dom uh, Bruno. Which which Dom, Dom just means Mister, really. Domnus means Lord, or Mister. Mister means Master, Lord of oneself, that kind of thing. That sounds so, good. Yeah, It'd so be good to be Lord of oneself. Lord, it would Michael. be good if we had became lords of ourselves, or not exactly. just egotists, but a little more uh, self mastery. Let the, divine, let the divine uh, take over our ego, yes. Yes. Absorb it, yes. So, so I understand today's a, a good day for you, but I can't remember why. Well, and I will, I will enlighten you, so to speak. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, uh, well, it's, it's first of all my, my birthday today, but uh, what makes it uh, fascinating for, uh, from, a, from a point of view of the universe or divine providence or synchronicity, whatever you will, uh, it's also the feast of Saint Bruno in the Catholic Church. Saint Bruno of Cologne is the founder of the Carthusians, the founder of the Carthusian order to which I belonged, as you just mentioned, uh, for, for for 22 years. Uh, so uh, I was predestined, if you will, it would seem, to to be a Carthusian since I was actually born on his feast day. Uh, and as 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 I later discovered, I'm as the only one in the whole order to be born on his feast day. So that's why I took the name. They asked me to take the name Bruno. The, uh, my religious name was Dom Bruno, because uh, because of that connection that I was uh, not only belonged to his order but was born on his feast day. So it's it's a very special day for me. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Very auspicious. Mm-hmm. So how long were you in that very silent cloistered monastery? So I was I was in the order for 22 years. I was. Uh, I was the very first novice and priest ordained in the Carthusians in the Western Hemisphere. We uh, we founded our uh, our house in one house we have in the U.S. in Vermont in uh, uh, originally in 1950, but the uh, current permanent monastery was opened in 1970, and I entered in 1972. Um, and after 12 years there, I was sent to the Grand Chartreuse, the place you just mentioned, the mother house in France. Since I was the first one formed in the U.S., they looked at me after my formation and said, nah, this didn't work. We're going to send them back to France uh, where we should send them. To, to, and I, I loved it there. It was, it was wonderful. I was supposed to stay for 15 months, and I stayed for seven years. I was even given the job of, uh, uh, after two years of, uh, of uh, making and distilling our famous Chartreuse liqueur, which was a really fun job. And now, then you're I also, talking, now you're talking the kind of minute. What Catholic monasticism I'm interested in? We in, right. the, in the Buddhist tradition uh, don't have that practice. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but the, the spirits uh, and the spirit uh, combined very well. I found for me, uh, 
and then I spent three years in, in England before I before I did leave the monastery. I didn't know you you had visited there with the Dalai Lama. You said it was in the 1980s. Yes, it was around 1989 or 90 or 91 or 92. It was after my well, three-year retreat. It might have been around 92 or 93. Maybe you were there at that time. Were you? Well, I was, there, I was there from 84 to 90. So if it was the late 80s, uh, you, we would pass close to each other. I'm thinking now it was like 92 or 93. It might have been 91. Not, the not, to, mention, not to mention we were close to each other, so to speak, at, yes. least, at least in proximity as we grew up. You know? Yes. Well, I was in the Tibetan three-year retreats from 1980 to 1989 there in southern France in the Dordogne Valley. Ah, yes. Yes. In the wilderness, in the wilds, with the ancient Lascaux cave paintings and the prehistoric cave paintings on the walls are. So the wonderful, deep resonance with people like us that love the ancient yet timeless messages and the deep. And, you know, of course, Tibetan cave yogis and all. Very and you saw, the, you saw the tankas on your own inner wall, of yes, course. of no course. That. Now and then. That's right. So since you were in the order, and I are in the order a long time, and also you were cloistered, so I assume, you know, that's a lot of practice and daily prayers and meditation and contemplation and also study. I know you know those languages, and ancient languages and Christianity well, as well as you're quite eclectic about all kinds of spiritual paths, specializing in Zen, but others, Michael. What do you think yeah. is the essence of all of this, or just the, you know, the, your your Christian side. Like for me, and this is the Awakening Now podcast. Obviously, I've been talking about Awakening for a few decades, and wrote the Awakening trilogy of American Buddhism, starting with Awakening the Buddha Within. So, Awakening, Awakefulness, Presencing, Awakening Now is for me the essence. And yes. you know, if you stripped everything away doesn't you don't need to close your eyes and meditate to awaken or be, pre be present but of course it's a good way to cultivate it as our prayer and yoga and chanting and meditation and devotion which transports us beyond ourselves and so on uh, what are your thoughts what's the essence of it all and how can we bring that forth in the, this new world the modern world the very secular scientific modern world where time seems so short. Yes, well, uh, as, as you say, it is, it is about awakening, uh, um, waking up. Uh, of course, that's what the Buddha means, the word Buddha, uh, the awakened one. Uh, but, you know, there's a verse in Ephesians, uh, uh, this New Testament scripture, you know, awake sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. So you're arising from the death of your, of your ego and your, uh, the blindness and the... Uh, distraction that you have uh, and your your life is being aligned uh, with with what you would call God the, the universe God, the uh, the absolute uh, you're um, you're being and you're being transformed into that uh, you're becoming more and more united with that and we realize our identification with that whether we call it you know transformation in Christ and union with the Trinity the mystical marriage or whether we whether whether we uh, whether we call it you know uh, the uh, the uh, awakening of the light of the absolute, you know, uh, that we become one with, that we realize our oneness with, um, or in the H in Hindu tradition, the, the same thing, Brahman and Brahman, there's this uh, sense of not just w opening up to and living more constantly in and being united more fully to the light, but actual transformation into the light and ultimately realizing our, our identity with it uh, through in some way. So that is what it's all about. But as you say, there are all sorts of ways of doing this. You know, you can go into a cave and focus just on that. Um, uh, but as I discovered in my own monastic life, that's not a guaranteed path, you know, to <laughs> enlightenment. Uh, no place is, because we have to face our own, our own inner, uh, inner demons and monsters, as St. Anthony of the Desert, you know, spoke of very graphically, for example. Um, or t in modern, more, more psychological language, the same thing. Um, so that ha it does not automatic that that happens. So it can happen anywhere. You know, I was a Jesuit for a while before I became a monk, and their idea is to be a contemplative in action, to be wake up more and more not only in the, not only in the midst of your action in the world, but through it. You know that you'll be so attentive to the call of God or to the uh, to the light of the Spirit or, or to that inner inner wisdom uh, in the very midst of your daily life that you're responsive to it moment by moment. Be here now. Uh, 
uh, that really is the secret. If you can really be more and more consciously present and awake and, and engaged fully here now, um, whatever the methods you're using, whatever your life, your life's calling may be, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, uh, that's the uh, that that's the essence of it, and it's accessible. It's immediately accessible, as all the traditions say. You know, the, 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 the spirit dwells within you. The light is within you already. You just have to you just have to wake up to it. It's there. So that's the way I try to teach people. Uh, you know, engaged in the midst of the world, saying, "Oh, well, I don't have time to go to a monastery. I can't spend three months or three years, you know, on a mountaintop." I say, "You don't have to. All you have to do is be present in your inner inner self." Um, and be contemplative, be awake, be open, be poor in spirit, you know, as we Christians say also, uh, to receive what's right in front of you and what's deep within you, the full scope of reality inside and outside, and ultimately, of course, there's no distinction, um, uh, to, uh, to be uh, transformed into, into that, you know, ultimately, it's love energy, the compassion energy, that we the light of, of, of love that we discover there. Well, that was a lot. That's beautiful. Really beautiful, and you made some fine, subtle distinctions. And one of them I want to highlight and reprise, in a sense, where you said it's not just awakening in the midst of your daily activities, but awakening through your daily activities, which is a little through different, them. because yeah. they are the way. It's not that they're a distraction, or they're the mud and you're the lotus. Right. They are the way, and the mud, the water, the lotus, the sun, and all is all interwoven and intermingled and interdependent and needed so awakening via one's daily activities and that brings us back to the issues of today where people feel like they don't have time or can't get away and it's sort of an old-fashioned or non-socially mobile idea that we have to go away and be either a monk or a lay person or go and retreat or just be in life that's an either or that it can't be integrated and that your life isn't enough of yeah, course, it's not enough. It's not enough without no. the spirit. But as yeah. you said, and and I want to, you know, also kind of raise this issue. You you quoted in the beginning from Ephesius about wake up, sleeper, and go forth in life and all. How come nobody told us that when I was growing up in the suburbs? I never heard that from Christianity. Well, I mean, you were in the Jewish tradition, right? So <laughs> I know, but I had plenty of Christian friends. That wasn't the kind of preaching and preachifying they were hearing. Now that is absolutely that is absolutely true, and it's uh, it's still true today. And I, I always make a huge point of this. It's true whether you're talking about Catholic churches or mm -hmm. evangelical mega churches, <clears throat> they, especially the ones that are always talking about the Bible. We have to go back to the Bible, the Scriptures. Well, they don't. I mean, we we don't. We we don't go or we pick and choose this or that. But nobody ever quotes Ephesians or Colossians or the uh, you know the, the great the even the, the great mystical treatises that are often attributed to St. Paul, it may not be him, uh, may not be he, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, these are tremendous mystical passages which speak, which speak about, you know, the, 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 the body of Christ filling the universe and all its parts and the eye, having the eyes of our heart enlightened and being led from glory to glory, uh, as it says in, in another place. Um, the, the great mystical passages, you know, of the transformation of ourselves and of the cosmos uh, in, 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 in the light of Christ and into Christ, you never hear it talked about. I know. And there's, oh. they're huge. Uh, and the reason is, I think, that people just don't understand it. They don't know what to make of it, including, and especially the preachers and the leaders and the priests and, and sometimes the bishops as well. Um, they weren't trained in that. Uh, they don't understand it. Uh, and so they really miss it. That's why I always go back myself uh, to when I preach or when I give courses to the fathers of the church, to the people of the fourth, the great mystic bishops and theologians of the fourth and fifth centuries, East Greek and Latin, uh, where, who have had tremendous mystical sense. They were not only, you know, church leaders, or they weren't just church leaders as administrators, they were church leaders as, as, as uh, mystics and theologians. And they often do quote these things, and uh, they have a whole vision, vision of the universe, which, uh, which is right there in the scriptures. So today, for example, when you go to a, to a library, any any library, or to to a bookstore, for example, and look, go look in the Christian section, you'll find all of this esoteric, you know, uh, Gnostic gospel kind of non-mainstream stuff as an effort to get back to the mystical. My what I insist on is that the mainstream, which we've lost, the real mainstream of Christianity, uh, is 
is right there already in the, in the scriptures as we have them. We don't have to go looking for other gospels. Uh, uh, we just go back to what we have and, and really take it seriously. And this is, this is so uh, exasperating for me uh, to see these magnificent texts that are just never cited because they're not understood and certainly not practiced. Well, it takes, the, you know, you have to have eyes to see. And that's, yes. uh, that's always been a, a challenge. So, and it's the blind leading the blind. Yes. The, right. the leaders haven't been trained in this. So we have an opportunity to cull the um, essential nuggets and, of course, to, to go deep ourselves so we can realize them and then recognize them and bring them forth and knowledge, this kind of knowledge and light wants and needs to be passed on. Yes, and whether it's vehicles, and vessels, including the good book, including us, or the preachers yeah. and teachers. But that yeah, we takes have some to. realization and inquiry and, <clears throat> and then culling it out and curating it and passing it on. Of course, that's why I try to do with my writings and, and Dharma talks and things like that. But it's a challenge uh, in any religion, of course. And the exoteric forms are so much easier for the uh, general yes. congregation to follow or understand or support. We have to have received this, this transmission ourselves, and uh, it's not really given in seminaries, and it wasn't even given in the monastery, to me, to be honest. Um, uh, but we have to, so we kind of lose the wisdom thread, you know, everywhere if we're not careful. So we have to receive it ourselves and be initiated ourselves by, by wisdom figures, uh, and, uh, whether novice masters or gurus or whatever, you know, in our own, in our own tradition, and then be able to pass it on. There's a good Latin adage, you know, nemo dat quod non habit, you know, no, no one can give what he doesn't have. Uh, so if we don't get it first, you know, we can't trans, transmit it, then we have kind of lost the wisdom thread, I believe, here in the West. So I'm tempted to ask you why it wasn't transmitted to you in the monastery life. But but it's, it's, that's a good question. Can it be um, transmitted? I mean, does one have to find it oneself, or is it a combination? Like, why wasn't it transmitted to you by your... Uh, Dear novice master. Well, as as I as I, uh, I I I I don't know what the actual situation is today, but in, in my own particular circumstance and in the monasteries I lived in, um, at first anyway, uh, there was uh, the emphasis has gone from from passing on cont contemplative tradition uh, had gone from that to to uh, what often is a substitute for it, law, rule, and authority. Mm -hmm. You just keep the rule or stay in your cell and that will teach you everything. Well, it might or, else, or it'll make you crazy. Uh, it, might, it won't necessarily make you wise. So you have to have people who are initiated. But uh, the, the novice, uh, the, the training at the time was really much more just following the rule. And, uh, and it said, oh, the Holy Spirit will teach you as a way of copying out because we can't teach you because we didn't get it ourselves. Mm. So, so it is. Um, and that was, it's not universally true, there were some wonderful, as I later met in, in the monastery, some wonderful wisdom figures who did help me a great deal. So they, they are there, but, but it, it is so easy to lose it. And I certainly didn't get it from the beginning. Uh, so once again, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a question of going to the right place to find the wisdom figures. You can, you, you can really find them, hopefully, anywhere. Uh, 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 but it is necessary to, to, to receive it. And as I say, a, a monastery or, or a seminary is, is not a guarantee, a guaranteed place to find it. Hmm. Well, everyone knows that the robes or the outfit don't make the, the man. Yes, um, yes. In, in our Buddhist monasteries, there's usually an abbot or like the master who may be administrative at running things and senior. And then there's the like, Vajra master, who's the lightning bolt or the practice leader, he's like, let's say, the most advanced spiritually and realized in spiritual practice. And they may be in, in, in one figure, but often it's in two or three. Yes. Yeah. And that uh, too often in the, in the, in the Catholic tradition, the, the temporal leader is also the spiritual leader. And usually, usually it's the spiritual that suffers <laughs> in relation to the, to the, to the temporal. Um, and the, the other the other element of this that's important is even those who are, have just reached this level of spiritual maturity and wisdom, um, in addition to the difficulty of knowing how to pass it on, there's also the psychological uh, element, which I think has been terribly neglected, mm -hmm. probably probably in 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 every tradition. You know, you can speak to that, you know where 
the, if, as soon as you delve in, and I discovered this very early, much to my dismay, not something I wanted to discover, if you, the deeper you go in the spiritual life, uh, the more the, uh, the traumas and the compulsions and the obsessions and the, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the un, un, untended, you know, psychological stuff, the monsters, as Father Keating calls it, the unloading of the unconscious, all of that takes place. And you have to be able to face, you know, all that, those, all the monsters that live inside those caves before they can be transformed into the caves of light. And that, in particular, and understandably so, is an area of growth um, and a challenging task, which, which ordinary, you know, spiritual leaders, ordinary uh, monks or, 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 or seminary instructors are just not, are not capable of, of, of addressing. Uh, and that's unfortunate, because there really does need to be a whole psychological element of training from someone for those who are going to be spiritual leaders, and uh, and that really is generally is generally not happening today. Well, we're all trying to bring that perspective into our traditions, and it's a challenge with the old traditions and the emphasis on preservation and continuity. So yeah, it's a challenge to adapt and innovate and experiment and improvise, but it's happening, and we have to do it, obviously. To be whole and not, you know, circum what's the word? circumvent those islands on our way to the goal and have to clean them up later, those psychological or physical dark sides or, or blind spots. Since you've talked about and we've been talking about transmission and realization and quoting the scriptures and the cloister and retreat life, don't you think that? And you teach Zen. You, you're the founder of the Dragon's Eye Zendo, in, yes. which meets regularly in Manhattan. I believe that one can contact or get transmission also from these archetypes, even if you don't have a physical master or guru, just as some people have visions or just ordinarily invite Jesus or somebody into their life. What do you think about that? How can people who don't necessarily have the wherewithal right now to go far or change their life entirely to be fully in the spirit in ashram or retreat center or on pilgrimage all year. How could they connect with this, the inner level of the light, the archetype of the higher power, whatever you call it, the Buddha within, the Buddha nature, our Buddhiness within. That's why I stress awakening, awakening to whom what we truly are. Not just imitating somebody else. Well, I do. I do believe that you know, you know, along the spiritual path, if we do take it seriously, we'll do, do, we do need to find some kind of guide, whether you call it a guru or a spiritual spiritual director, or, you know, or a teacher of some kind, uh, because of uh, not just the psychological, but uh, the spiritual challenges we face uh, along the way. So I do think a leader, a, a guide, at some point is is is, is essential. But I do like your your. Your emphasis on the on the archetypes, as as you call them, I've often reflected, especially you know, um, I remember when I visited the Rubin Museum in Manhattan a few years ago, where I'm a member in, in the, the Tibetan Muse Buddhist Museum, and they had a, the, an exhibition on the Red Book of Jung, and I was saying to myself, wow, you know, maybe all the traditions can start coming together on on this level of archetype, you know, which we all share somehow at a deep level, you know, the the, the liberator, the the uh, the, the the lover the, the priest the king uh, the figure the soldier the the warrior figure all of these great archetypes uh, um, can be uh, can be ways that that, that and we, we use it in our own traditions uh, especially especially as I understand and as I practice even a little bit the, the Tibetan traditions with the Dayani Buddhas and these these different uh, um, uh, yes. bodhisattvas the bodhisattvas which can be there which are really centers of energy and can instruct us and the meditation deities. Exactly. Outer, outer and inner and, and, exactly. and subtlest. Plus, of course, you know, in the in the in the Catholic tradition, in the, in the Christian tradition, it's I mean, is Christ Himself, who, in His very humanity, is is an icon of God, uh, as we would put it, and and we we contact Him through uh, we, the sacraments, through prayer, uh, through our own uh, through our own inner inner uh, uh, contact with with the Christ, and and we can even use you know physical icons, as has been very powerful in our in our uh, Christian tradition, especially in the in the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox, um, 
to use that these uh, as vehicles, as gates, as uh, open doors uh, for uh, for uh, transformation and what we what we gaze upon. And of course, you, you know, you do that in the Tibetan tradition too. You use them, of course, as you gaze upon them, and you ultimately you realize your identity with them. Uh, so, so these can be teachers, these can be guides as well. But even in the midst of that, I think you're going to need some uh, uh, someone at your side, a human at your side, to to help you um, metabolize that and interiorize that in a healthy mm-hmm. and progressive way. Yes, I tend to agree, and I we've both benefited a lot by our wisdom guides and spiritual directors and, and masters, of course. So, I love chanting. In our, yes. in our satsang and in our ashram in India and Ram Das is, you know, guru, we will receive our names from. We do a lot of kirtan, bhakti, devotional chanting. Yes. Bhakti yoga. The, the guru or the devotional object is a portal to the ultimate, to God, to the highest. And how chanting and sacred music like yoga and other prayer and meditation practices, contemplative practices, chanting transports us beyond ourselves, out of our head, into our heart, if you want to put it a little, you know, kind of narrowly, but transports us beyond our small selves into the higher power, the supreme self, or whatever you call it, the whole, losing ourselves and finding our true self, if you want to put it in Zen terms. Don't you have some Gregorian chanting in your tradition? I've heard you chant, and it's beautiful. Would you mind, would you like to, as it's your birthday in St. Bruno's, birthday and wouldn't it be auspicious and probably a lot of our friends uh tuning into this haven't heard benedictine type Gregorian yeah. chanting uh, could, could you chant for us for two or three or four minutes something and then tell us what it is or translate it yeah i'll share just the prayer, I, share the prayers and the, the vibrations with us please i would absolutely love to do that uh uh just a quick uh, note uh, don't let the carthusians hear you call them benedictines they're okay. uh, <laughs> They're a hermit order, and the Benedictines are, you know, a, a, a kind of Cenobitic or a community order. Okay. But, uh, but it, it's uh, uh, so we have our own right, our own simplified type of Gregorian chant, and I and I loved doing it. We chanted, we chanted, you know, in community uh, close to five hours a day, so that every day. So this was this is no small thing. The the amount of chant we used so it was obviously very central. And no one, like most marvelous things, like the Gospels themselves or many of the scriptures and other traditions, we don't know who actually composed it. It's just because uh, because the individual name gets lost in, 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 in tremendous mm-hmm. beauty and of the splendor of the absolute that's being communicated. But I was I was a cantor. I, I led the choir mm-hmm. when I was grand chartreuse, and I so I really really did enjoy the chant. And now even today, at the end of every mass I celebrate in the Catholic Church, I uh, I sing a Gregorian chant, a small antiphon, and. Uh, Sometimes I, I introduce uh, in some places where I do do uh, do uh, 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 my Zen teaching. I, I begin with a, a chant to set the mood. So I will sing this chant. One of my favorite ones. Uh, one of the last time, one of the one places I sang it was in uh, the capital of Bhutan mm-hmm. when I was there at an interfaith gathering. Probably mm-hmm. the first time. Who knows? Maybe no, not. Right. I never heard Gregorian chant in the, in Bhutan. But this is the one I chose. What it's language? Like, what language are you going to be chanting in? So the Gregorian chant, uh, the, the words and the uh, and the and the music are inextricably intertwined. So it, so it's Latin, and you can't really translate it. So I'll tell you, this is some the beginning of Psalm uh, one twenty two, uh, which is a song of ascent, a song of pilgrimage, which we're all on. Um, I rejoice when they said to me, "Let us go to God's house." So that's like the. We're not only going to heaven; we're going into our inner, 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 inner castle, inner city of the New Jerusalem within. So I rejoiced when I heard them say, "Let us go to God's house. May peace reign in your walls and in your palaces, abundance." So it's a beautiful chant and a beautiful sentiment, and it takes about two minutes to sing. So <clears throat> here we go.
Yes. God's house. Exactly. It's, uh, this is really wonderful stuff. It brings you right into that inner, it quiets you immediately and, and Gorgeous. uplifts you. That's a piece that, that is uh, sung on what's called Letare Sunday, Rejoice Sunday in the middle of Lent. We rejoice in the middle of Lent, that preparation for Easter, because we're right in the middle and we're getting closer to Easter, the, the joy of resurrection. And uh, uh, it's 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 uh, sun during the uh, during the mass during the liturgy the main the main liturgical celebration we have, and it's sung at other times as well. But that's uh, yeah. what does it mean really to enter into God's house, to find our place in, in the divine world here, or after we die? Or I know well, it, I know they say God's mansion, my father's mansion, has many houses. Uh, my father's house, there are many dwelling yeah, places. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The, uh, how do we do that? How do we take up our abode in, quote, God's house or live in a sacred manner in the sacred world and treat others sacredly? Well, that's, uh, yeah, the, the dwelling places, uh, Las Moradas, it's uh, St. Teresa, Jesus called her whole book on mystical life, that the dwelling places. So I, I think we go back to, you know, uh, being just aware of being in the temple, waking up and contemplating the fact that, that, that we are all, you know, in God's house and our God's house, there was a, a famous Jesuit a cardinal, a French cardinal, Daniel Lou, who wrote a book. He was a scholar of the patristic period that I was talking about before in the fourth and fifth centuries. And he wrote a book called The Temple in, in, in a translation. And uh, it, it was about the different types of house, temple. Uh, and he said, the whole of religion and spirituality is contained right here. If you just have that notion that the universe itself is a temple of God, the created universe, that uh, not just the buildings of the Old Testament or the, uh, or the, or the church, uh, the body of Christ is the temple. We are the temple. Uh, the New Jerusalem is a temple. Uh, everywhere is the temple. So if we just wake up to that fact, if we, if we become aware of uh, God's inhabiting us or, or, or the, 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 the immediate contact with the absolute, that we can have in our own bodies and hearts and minds and souls, if we have it in, in our neighbor, uh, in, 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 in the universe itself, the whole created universe, uh, as well as in, in, in the church and in our, in our own uh, specific traditions, um, then, uh, then, then, we, we, uh, then that's, that's, that's how we can truly live. And of course, what that means when we realize we are God's house and everything else is at the same time. Everything is sacred. Everyone is sacred. Everyone shares the Christ nature, the Buddha nature, however you want to speak of it. Well, then we treat each other. Not only do we treat each other with love and respect and wanting the, the flourishing of life and an abundance of, of love for everyone and everything, and we pour that out, but we become the channel for that. We're not the source of that. We simply become the channel for that. And so the, 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 the torrent, the current of love and light and joy is all the more powerful because it's just, we're just, we're just the, uh, the reed through whom it passes. Uh, the, uh, the, the canal, uh, as well as participating it in ourselves. So uh, that, that's, a, a, I think, a great vision uh, to guide our daily lives. What a beautiful vision. You're singing oh. like the poet saints Rumi or Kabir. Yes, yes. It is universal. I am the hollow flute, play through me. And exactly. The world exactly. Will dan dances. And We're all the my, jewels. Of it. My breath is, you know, the Lord's breath coming through my 
fruit. And, and many, many images can be used, like like we're all we're all jewels, uh, different reflect reflection reflecting gems. You know, it's it's a, a very powerful image from the Book of Revelation and and, and other books of Scripture. And, uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, the, the high priest in the Jewish tradition had a you know a breast breastplate a breast piece that had you know the set the twelve jewels so it, I always loved that symbolism as mm -hmm. well reflecting the light in all sorts of different ways and we rejoice in the diversity even as we see the light which is universal in everyone and that seems to be the way of God if you will uh, loving the diversity and the midst of the unity etc. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, finding unity and diversity is. One thing, and that's a major endeavor that we, those of us who feel called, need to pursue. But then integrating that with the diversity and loving the diversity as well, that's another challenge. I, right, and uh, that seems like, to be the way the, God, the way that God likes it. Yeah. It's like the Dharmakaya <laughs> yes. koan and the Namanakaya koan, or seeing everything, right. our life as the way, not just... Be, you know, being amidst our life and trying to find a way amidst our life, but that our life, every step of the way is the great way. Or as we say in the Zen tradition, particularly, you know, the, uh, the emptiness is form and form is emptiness, that you find the absolute right there in the concrete, and that's, that's its beauty, mm -hmm. to be what it is and be reflecting the absolute in that way, in that prismatic fashion. So what kind of meditation would people do if they were like, let's say relating in a theistic way, the way you're discussing, and yet you're teaching them Zen meditation and things like that? Well, if people do want, if, uh, I, I do have mainly uh, Catholics, but, but not, not only in my, in my Zendo. Uh, but so, I mean, they can follow that. Uh, but uh, one way I do use, and I've used for a number of years, uh, for those who want a more specifically uh, theistic and Christian way, uh, here in my parish uh, every week, uh, I have uh, what's called centering prayer. It's a Thomas Keating's, a famous abbot Thomas Keating's uh, way of, uh, of prayer, where you simply, and it goes back to the uh, 15th century uh, mystical treatise called The Cloud of Unknowing. Um, so it has a very great, you know, Christian Catholic pedigree. Uh, some, uh, some, some people complain, oh, this is just yoga in disguise. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, which wouldn't be bad, by the way. But it, it, it is specifically Christian. This is where, you know, where I say we've lost the thread of our own tradition. We don't realize we have these great mystical classics there. So he resurrected that. It was actually Pope Paul VI that asked the Trappists, of which he's a, a member, uh, to, to bring uh, contemplation, to bring inner prayer back to the laity, back to ordinary uh, Catholics. And so that was, that was, it was the, the centering prayer movement in the 1970s was uh, partly, uh, in large measure, a result of that um, request from the Pope himself, um, Pope Paul VI. So uh, it's, it's really a matter of just fo focusing on, in faith, we would say, in silence on, on the inner presence, a uh, uh, mysterious, silent presence of God. And, and that's this particular method. You, you, you choose a, a sacred word of one or two syllables that you don't meditate on, but it's a tool to re-anchor your awareness uh, when, uh, when it gets distracted. And Thomas Keating even says you, you can even just use your breath as a way of recentering yourself mm -hmm. on the presence of God. And there you're getting very close to Zen right there. We're simply focusing on the breath to be present to, uh, to, whatever, to the reality as it is or and as it is within you and around you. It has, it's very similar to the Tibetan practice of Dzogchen and Mahamudra. Father exactly. Thomas asked me to teach him that, and we discussed it. Of course, I said, there's nothing you don't know already here about yeah. the natural state and just abiding in the presence, whatever yes. you yeah. call it. In Tibet, we call it Rigpa, but yeah. Kainobu Rinpoche translates that as presence, so you're ready back to just like centering prayer with, with or without the theistic theology, but the actual state or the, the practice we cultivate, that's very much similar, just and that being present, incandescently present, open, surrendered, and letting go, letting be, not fabricating the, anything or manipulating or asking for anything on the ego that's, side. That's the Dog Chen, right? I mean, yes. it's very much very similar to Zen uh, practice. Yes, yeah. the natural great perfection, the highest teachings of Tibetan Buddhism. So I'm feeling like it's your birthday and we should give you some kind of present. <laughs> well, you're the president, you know, you know, well, so that's, that's good. <laughs> we should give you a good president, but let's not go into that oh, since it's the yeah. election season. But right, right. I saw my uh, sort of beach buddy, 
Alan Dershowitz, the famous lawyer on yes. Martha's Vineyard in the summer, um, you know, also some of the other political type people. And, and uh, he told me his new book is called Electile Dysfunction. <laughs> I think I heard that title. It might have been from you. Yes. Yeah. So that's not my present to you, though. <laughs> it's just to cheer up and, and, and say, you know, this local election and this four year cycle is not the whole picture. Yeah, I yeah. do hope everybody is, especially the younger generation to come out and vote so we don't have a surprise. Yes, right. Exactly. And that's part of it. Our daily life is the path and awakening together yeah. and that no one's no one of us can do it all alone, but no one's exempt. From trying, and yes. So it's, it's not so. It's not just a personal challenge right. or a personal quest. I mean, we do it for the sake of, of our fellow human beings, of our of our society. Right. We have to right. wake up for the sake of the world. Yes, the world and the environment yeah. and our society. Yes. And as the Dalai Lama says, we need each other to get enlightened because we're all interdependent and interconnected. We need each other, and especially we need warm, empathic compassion, not just wisdom. So that's where others come in. So, yes. as we yeah. have had a wonderful uh, dialogue, as we always do when we get together, how about guiding us with a little meditation to complete this seance and awaken us now? So uh, That's my gift to you. Oh, all right. Well, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you get to meditate and lead a guide and share a, a meditation with us all. Well, I would just uh, I would just suggest we we, we, we do that kind of inner focus uh, in silence, uh, maybe connecting to uh, if it's not too too strange, uh, connecting to a, a flow of of life and love, uh, um, imagining the sun and the light of of, of, of divine love uh, uh, flowing into our hearts and through our minds and through our bodies. Uh, that might be a, a a very good meditation, or you can just be focusing on your breath or on the silent presence of God, however your particular tradition sees it. But uh, to be able to uh, to breathe, <clears throat> to rest, be comfortable in your in your body, uh, to be uh, re relaxed and alert at the same time, as we know from from our posture, but to relax and in an attitude of openness and trust and and peaceful joy, if possible, uh, be open to the inpouring, uh, whether through through our crown, through our heart, uh, through our uh, through our souls, uh, of this inpouring of the divine light, uh, love, uh, uh, which are the same thing, uh, as we discover, uh, into our hearts. To allow that to pacify us and to energize us at the same time, and to feel that you know going out from our hearts, uh, going out from uh, ourselves uh, uh, into the world. Maybe we can just. Uh, Rest in that for, for a moment. Uh. resembles the med meditation on the twin hearts I got actually from my yoga teacher. And he used the prayer of St. Francis who's, who's of Assisi, whose feast day we celebrated two days ago, uh, to conclude the meditation. And uh, perhaps uh, I could just say that very uh, calmly. And Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled, but to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, 
For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Thank you. Amen. Swaha. <laughs> right, Swaha. Yeah, Swaha. Thanks very much, Father Michael Halloran. Well, thank you, Surya Das, for inviting me on this uh, this uh, venerable and uh, program. You know, with, with yes. so uh, illustrious a personage as yourself. Awakening so. now. You yes. can find this online, and Michael has a website. You can look it up. What is it, Mike? So it's www. Michael K. Holleran, all one word, Michael K. for Koryu or Kevin, whichever one you want. Michael K. Holleran, H-O-L-L-E-R-A-N, michaelkholleran.org or com, and you'll get uh, my website where I have my, my, I have my uh, Catholic sermons, I have my Zen shows, and I have a number of workshops and retreats that I've given. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Happy birthday and blessings. Thank you so much. Blessings to one and all, and tune in next time for more. May we all be now. born. May we all be born every day. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Buddha bless. And homage to the Buddha, the divine, the light in your seat. Don't overlook Thank it. Thank you.